Hi everyone, my name's Ashok and I'm going to be talking about migrating content to Drupal using the Dru using the migrate module. And I'm a, I'm going to glance over a few different methods you can do it, but I'll mainly focus on how to get it get everything to work using the migrate module. Uh some of the drush commands that uh work with this and uh, a Q&A session if there's time. And I just wanted to add a disclaimer before I start anything regarding this presentation that it is somewhat code heavy and you may fall into a coma as a result. And um, this is new territory for me in terms of uh, presentation material So, and I'm only talking about one small aspect of the migration part which is migrating nodes. I'm not really going to be talking about creating other types of migration paths, like whatever else the migrate module can handle, or uh, talking about creating your own field handlers, which is ways to uh, migrate certain elements that are associated with the node um, that's not already been implemented. But we can walk through an example module that I did if people would like, or we can go in any other direction. and. If there are any questions that pop up during this presentation, just raise your hand up and we'll try and answer it at that time. It'll hopefully make everything better. So the first method, sure. Um, so the first method for you doing your migration is you can migrate all of your content by hand. It'll be accurate. It'll you can get your <laughs> files and um, if you have some people that you absolutely hate at your workplace. This is a good way to get revenge on them. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm mentioning this because this is a legitimate option that people use. In fact, at my own uh, campus, we used it to migrate content from Drupal 5 into Drupal 6. And we had two really wonderful and patient interns that did all of it for us. So it's an option, but I don't recommend it. Um, yes, but they were awesome. They were absolutely awesome. Um, you can use the node export module. And what that will let you do is any content that you have on your current website, it'll let you export it out into either a CSV file or an XML file or even serialized PHP code. And um, it'll let you then import that content into a separate site that you may have. The one caveat with all of this is there's no way to update content that you have in Drupal 6 into Drupal 7. Because the way the object is uh, built out is completely different, there's just no way. Uh, people are trying to figure out ways, but the whole CCK and taxonomy aspect of it is, is uh, broken. And the other thing is if you do do, if you create a migration process and you get all of this content in but you realize you made a mistake, uh, there's no way to easily remove it aside from going into the admin interface and you know, going page by page and deleting all that stuff. So if you have lots of content, that's not the best way to do it. Um, this was one that Ishmael brought up and I think this is a fantastic method. Uh, you can use the feeds module and you could use that to import content from one site that has feed set up into your Drupal site. So what this basically means is that you have a site that's running in .NET, no problem. If you can set up a feed for it, it can still be migrated into Drupal. Uh, it's extremely well documented and it has a really good UI mm -hmm. as well. So if you're someone that's not necessarily used to coding, feeds might still get you all the way there and bring all of your content in. For someone like myself who is a programmer, I, I do sometimes see that um, you might still run into issues if the content is updated on the source site and it doesn't necessarily get updated in the feed itself. So, you know, if I have some event and I add some last minute details, that might not, those last minute details might not come in. And this also doesn't have the best way to try and roll back on any kind of migration that you do. So again, bringing in content, find a mistake, have to go through the admin UI for this. Uh, so for this presentation, I'm focusing on the migrate module. Obviously, I'm listing a lot of pluses since that's what I used, but uh, just to give an idea, it has a lot of these definitions already built out. 
So you can already migrate from an XML file or JSON or CSV or from any database that Drupal supports. So SQL Server is supported by Drupal 7 now. So that's part of the list. Uh, you can import many different types of content. Um, I listed out all the core entities. Those are already importable at this point. And when I mentioned this, the destination handler thing, you can basically define your own import handler to bring in some other type of content that's not necessarily a node or comment or whatever, but it'll still be a part of your site. Uh, you can also define your own method for importing custom fields. So, so let's say in this other site that you have, uh, you have a separate files table or whatever built out for it. You can, you can basically bring all that content in and have it become part of a proper node or part of the media module, which is becoming more and more popular. Um, and probably the best part about the Migrate module is that it has Drush integration. So for any given type of uh, content that you want to migrate in, you just have to run import and it'll start importing all that content in. Or if it finds some new piece of content, that import will pick it up. Oh, this piece of content has been updated. Let me update the destiny, like the node that's associated with it in my current site. Uh, have it as well. Or if you royally screw up, um, it has a rollback option. So you can remove any content that you brought in um, within your last migration. And it also provides feedback. So if you want feedback, like you just want to know the status of how things are going every 60 seconds or every 50 items, Drush has, uh, it'll show you status based on those uh, different parameters. The biggest downside of using the Migrate module is that it's all code at this point. So uh, whatever UI that they have for it, it's only for showing what uh, things you have the ability to migrate into your site. So if I go to my website and I go into the content section and I see Migrate, it can take a bit of time to load up. As you can see, it shows the different migration things I have, but there's nothing I can do with it. Everything runs from Drush in this scenario, and anything you want to be able to migrate in, you have to write by, write by hand. And the documentation that's currently there is a little bit lacking. What, and what I mean by that is they have provided an example module that you have to basically go through to figure out what, what to do. And um, I'm in the process of writing out more and more documentation. This presentation is to try and help flesh it out in my head as well on what this documentation should be. But uh, yeah. And some assumptions that I'm making for this presentation are that we're migrating from another database. And in this scenario, this database just happens to be a Drupal 6 website. Keep in mind, though, that you can use any kind of database. It doesn't have to be a Drupal website that you're migrating into another Drupal website. And the other thing, for simplicity's sake, is because I'm migrating files along with this, uh, I'm assuming that the files directory uh, and this destination site are all on the same machine. So let's dive into it. So there are, there are a few steps to work with the Migrate module. Uh, first, you let Migrate know about your module and that there is, that it's something that implements the whole Migrate process. And it requires one hook. But this hook is exactly the same across any other module that you would have for this whole migration process. That said, the, big, the meat and bones of all of this are that you have to build out a migration class. And are people familiar with what a class is in, in PHP? I see some heads shaking and some heads nodding. So, so the best way to describe it would be, think of it as a blueprint on which uh, you have certain states and behaviors associated with an object. So a person can be considered a class and them having you know, the number of hands that they have, the number of feet that they have, they are attributes. And me walking 
would be considered a behavior. So basically when you have a migration class, you're kind of defining what kind of structure um, this thing will have. So it will have a description. It lets, uh, it lets the migrate module know what you're getting content from, what type of content you're getting, and it lets, it lets the migrate class have an assumption that you have these fields already mapped out that you're going to be bringing in from wherever it is that it's coming from. And optionally, uh, this is something that you don't have to write, but more likely than not, you will end up doing so. Uh, you have the ability to add any extra fields that you couldn't get from the initial mapping. And what I mean by that is, let's say we're bringing in something from the database, like users. Now, users have different roles associated with them. But when you do the initial SQL query mapping, you can't bring all of these rows in within the same query. It breaks out the user to have, you know, user one has role of administrator, user one has role of regular user, and so forth. So to try and avoid that, you make this generic query, and then Migrate has the ability to let you go back to whatever your source is and say, okay, query this table, get the roles that are associated with this user, and then add them in. So it's a second step that you have the ability to add additional fields or to even uh, clean up any data that's coming in. So if you had a bunch of HTML that was uh, formatted poorly, this portion allows you to go in and clean it all up. So step one, we define the hook. Like I mentioned, uh, that's the hook right there. Function my module under, or hook underscore migrate underscore API. But the contents of it are exactly the same. And the main reason that this hook exists is for the migrate module to know what version of its API you're implementing for your migration. So previously they were on version one and any new migrations that they're doing right now are on version two of their API. So that's all you're defining. And once you do that, you're done with it. That's the end of my classes. Or sorry, the end of my hooks. So now we get into building an actual class. And in each of the migrations that you do, uh, the class will define the type of content that's going to be imported into your site. So, uh, you know, like I mentioned, it'll be defining if you're importing users or taxonomy terms or nodes or files, whatever. And it consists of two functions inside this, inside this class. And one of them is a constructor, which is public function underscore construct, and the optional function, which is public function prepare row. And that's where you do the massaging of the data or adding any additional data. And where I have class node content type migration extends migration, the node content type migration can be substituted by whatever your whatever your class name would be. But generally, you want to try and have it be uh, defined. You want to try and name it to whatever you're trying to uh, migrate into your site, just for clarity's sake. And just to give an example of that again, um, this is one of the classes that I have. So the site that I was doing all of this work for is Redcat. And they have basic pages on their site. So my class name is Red Cat Basic Page. Ashok, yes. Just in steps, confusing. What does it mean in the class to extend something else? Just okay. So people understand that line. Okay, so that's a great question. So the nice thing about having classes in PHP are the fact that. Um, you can have this generic template or blueprint, as I'd mentioned before, for a particular type of object. But, um, like I've given the example of a person. So now let's give the example of a, a boy. So now we would have a class boy, which extends person. It will share some of the same behaviors and some of the same attributes but it may have additional behaviors or additional attributes that the core person class would not have. 
Yes, Steve mentioned something that an attribute that boys have, but a generic person might not have. <laughs> and um, and I think I'll refrain from saying what it was, but people get the idea. <laughs> so this was just explaining what I had on the previous slide, like you know what the constructor is, what kind of thing you're bringing in, all of that. And so now we go in and create a description and what some of the source fields are for this migration. So a description is it's pretty simple. It just kind of explains to the user what kind of migration is going to be taking place with this module. So whenever someone's looking at the admin UI or something like that, they can kind of get an idea from that particular page. Uh, let's see. Like here. So it shows migrate Red Hat basic pages. That's just the description. That's nothing big. Um, it has this portion called source fields now. And in here, you basically define any fields that won't necessarily be a part of your query, or since I'm talking about databases, which won't be a part of your query, but are still going to be brought into the site. So I've given the example with users and roles. So roles are not going to be mapped out in that initial query, but they do exist. And you kind of want to list them out so that when you're looking at something like this in the admin UI portion, you see that, oh, I have this field. I haven't mapped it out yet. This is some, something that I can work with. It doesn't necessarily need to be there, but it's just a helpful tool for someone that's uh, developing out the migration process. Oops. And now I'm going to go a little bit off course. And part of all of this is that um, because I'm using Drupal 7 for a lot of this stuff, obviously the whole database layer has changed. And when you're setting up the query, obviously you're going to be looking at a different database. And it, could, it might not be on the same server that uh, your source site is on. So what you can do is, in the same way that you'd set up a database connection for you know, your, your current Drupal site, you'd build one out for you know, being able to connect to the other database that you have. And you basically use database double colon get, get connection to be able to switch over to using that particular database. And then basically what happens is where I'm defining for migration and default, that's just the uh, array that you have for when you're defining all this stuff. And then you can write out the rest of the query. Alternately, if they're both on the same machine and they both happen to be MySQL or, yeah, most likely MySQL, then you can use a shortcut. So I have DB select and then my migration database name uh, dot and then the name of the table that you have. And this basically lets uh, PHP look at that other database that you have without having to change your uh, database connection or change databases or anything like that. It's a nice little shortcut that works really well. And that's what I'm going to be using through some of this code that I have. So what you do is you set up the query. And this is just a call to grab all the various pieces of data that you can in a single query. And you can see that it's doing a database select. In my case, I was joining it with the node table from my Drupal 6 version of the site and getting a various uh, set of fields that are there with it. Now, if all of this looks really foreign to you, um, it is because it's the, uh, the new version of how you do database queries and all of that stuff, and I highly recommend looking at the documentation that's there for this stuff. Is uh, that for PHP 5 or? This is for Drupal 7. 7. Yes. Uh, even for Drupal 6, the migrate module require, requires you to use the database TNG module, and that implements this similar kind of structure. Okay. Yes? On that topic, are you, would you strongly recommend, or where is your position on using Drupal 7 in an enterprise environment where you have a lot of form interaction and custom data and searches based on custom data versus using um, Drupal 6 where you have to use Drupal to administer all the content as opposed to having the data in separate 
external databases. Do you think Drupal 7 is ready for that or not? I don't know if Drupal 7 is there quite yet, but in six months, that will be a completely different answer. Um, but if we're launching within the next three to five months? I would still... The question? Pardon? What was the question? You might want to repeat that. Is, uh, is Drupal 7 ready for the enterprise? Drupal Gardens? Yes. It already went beta. I mean, it already went 1.0. It, but that's that's a different. And I mean, you if you're considering really Drupal, large sites that launched on Drupal 7. Yes. Yeah. So that was going to be my second. But specifically to you know, custom data searches form interaction, where that's the whole purpose of the site, and where where you have these searches based on all this custom data, and you have a lot of content <coughs> administration that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Is do you think seven is still? I it think sounds like you're saying seven might not quite be there yet. And our launch date is before your six to month a, window. To a large extent, it is already there. You have to do some more work initially to get it there. But with that said, right. So examiner.com. That's what I was about to say. So a good example of this would. If you're going to be doing custom work, it's as solid as it gets. You're going to have some bugs right now, more, more than you have in 6. 6 has the majority of the bugs worked out. <clears throat> the flip of that is the API is not as strong. That's why you don't have some of the bugs, is because they simply go, we can't do that unless you have 4. And there's another important thing to keep in mind, that if you roll out 7 now, then you're going to have roughly 3 years of 7's life cycle. And then when 8 gets rolled out, all the contributed and all the modules on CO is going to be supporting. So you're, if you roll out 7 now, you technically have roughly, based on the last few releases, 6 years of support. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point yep. for the enterprise, because the enterprise implementation tends to have a life cycle of 7 years, -ish, in which case you almost don't have a choice but to go on 7, um, because you've got about 6 years of work cycle. If eight takes three years to come out like seven or nine, I guess you'd be looking at triple nine or seven years away. Yeah. If you're going to start a new project, you're better off just starting it on Drupal 7, even if it is a little bit buggier than what a Drupal 6 uh, code base might get for you. And Unless it's just super simple. Pardon? Unless it's just dumb, simple, and some functionality is missing. Right. right. But even in that case, like, like, I'm doing for the Red Cat stuff. It would have been it would have been really really easy for me to build out a Drupal six version of the site, considering the site's already in Drupal six. But with that said, this is a client that we don't sub that doesn't get as much support as in most cases clients usually should. So by moving it to a Drupal seven code base, we're kind of guaranteeing that yeah, it'll. We can stay on this code base for, you know, three, four years before we start thinking about moving it into Drupal 8 or 9 territory. And the beauty about using something like the Migrate module or any other kind of migration module is that it doesn't really matter which version of Drupal you're going to. Um, I was talking with one other person, Marco, that's right there, um, who was working on a Drupal 7 site, but it wasn't feasible, so he was thinking about moving it down into Drupal 6. Now, the migrate module stuff that I'm showing here, the code would be exactly the same between version 6 and version 7. Even though it's using the whole database layer, that's all, ch that's all different. There's a module that kind of incorporates all of this stuff that's in there, so you can kind of just drop it in to Drupal 6 and it wouldn't know any better. And it'll still migrate all the content in. Uh, in whatever way it's set up. Well, if for, sorry, uh, sounds like some other people have similar interest, but we've been working on our project just for a couple of months, and in about three to four more months, we expect to launch an alpha. And I'm just wondering if other people would think also that if, uh, since we are doing some custom work, but to your point, we are doing some very basic stuff, it's just we happen to be the first people. 
doing it. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing anything that's special and unique in terms of coding or database manipulation. It's just that we haven't found a single module within any of the Drupal community that does exactly the type of sorting and searching and viewing that, that we're trying to do for our results in our database. It, it, I don't know. I'm not a programmer, but we have about 15 million uh, lines uh, in our main, one of our main databases. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a sort of a forms portion where we're building some custom forms on the fly, and there's about 7,000 forms that we're working with. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's interested in hearing more about that, or that sounds like something that you might have a really The only thing I can on. say is, in my experience from the database side, that it seems to run better and faster. So if you don't know, I mean, as far as the query of the overall On seven? Factor, if you move to seven, you're going to appeal to a lot more people that are hiring. Okay. A lot more people that are going to be interested in jumping on a seven project than six. Yeah, like that's a great point because, like, books, for example, like if you're an author, no one's writing books for Drupal 6 anymore. And that's been for like what, six, eight months that, oh, yeah. you know, everything is Drupal 7. There was a Drupal 5 book that came out last year, though. It was? Probably just because it needs a lot of love. Why to upgrade from Drupal 5 to Drupal 6? No, it was about views. Our interpretation just comes from having worked with 7 and trying to incorporate a couple of modules and having everything break from what we thought should appear to Oh, okay. Um, so. On this previous page, I had this uh, sort by at the bottom of it, and in most cases, it's not necessary. But the main reason I had it in there is the migrate module has a feature called high water, and it's a key to designate and figure out if a piece of content needs to be updated rather than inserted. So if I've already imported content into the website, and someone made updates on the other, you know, the other version of the site that I have this high water thing will be able to pick it up and say that this content's new, but it already exists in this current site. So just update it with whatever changes have been made to it. Yes? Is it, when you're, when you're migrating over, are you automatically mapping over the node ID and that's what it's actually matching on? It's not match, in this case, I'm mapping on the on the timestamp. No, no, I, just, of I understand the timestamp, but it's like for me to know that I'm importing a old node mm -hmm. that it actually matches something in the new site. So right. yes, I can say, okay, great, the change timestamp in this one is higher than the change timestamp in the this site I'm migrating mm -hmm. to. But is it matching the nodes based on node ID? Yes. Okay. In this, yeah, in this case, like, like what I'll show is when you're defining your mappings. On this screen, you're basically defining what your primary key is in this source database that you have. And in my case, it happens to be called NID because, again, it's a Drupal site. But it could be, it could just as easily be, I don't know, uh, content ID. That could be the name of that field that you have on that particular thing. And that's why I just give it a description that this is the Drupal 6 unique node ID that I have. So, you know, you define your mapping here and you just tell it what kind of schema it has. And this is only for defining what the key, the primary key is in your source database. Once you have that, then you do, you know, then you have my source is migrate source SQL and then that query that I had before and then the source fields, which I'd shown a few slides back. That piece right there. Uh, where are we? 
<clears throat> yeah. And then we say what the destination is, which is this particular site, but uh, the part that it shows new migrate destination node, that's the type of thing that we're bringing into the site. So the migrate module has one called migrate destination user, migrate destination comment, migrate destination taxonomy, and migrate destination file in those similar terms. And as I had mentioned, you can build out your own if you feel comfortable enough to do so. And once we have all of that out of the way, let me just show what, what you end up with. Uh, let's see. So when I go back to this whole migration page and I look at the Redcat basic page, I haven't laid out any mappings for fields or anything like that. But as you can see, it kind of shows all of the stuff that's there. And it'll show what's being mapped and what's, being, what's not yet being mapped onto the site. So as you're scrolling through it, for the destination, it shows that the node ID has kind of been picked up and, you know, it'll get... It'll, get, it'll sort itself out, but it has no information about whether who the user ID is or anything like that. And similarly, when you go to the source section, you can see the query that you had generated. This is what is going to be running on that, uh, on that other site that you have, on the other database that you have. And all of the fields that were there and a part of it show up in red here because none of them have been mapped. And as I would mentioned, the... Uh, the source fields, like the linked files and all of that kind of stuff, you'll notice they're not, it's a bit to read in there, but those fields aren't there in the query. But because I defined them in the source, uh, where is it? In the source fields, that's how the migrate module knows that these fields exist somewhere or are going to exist somewhere, and the mappings for them are missing. <coughs> So from there we get into mapping out fields. So it usually follows the form of, for this object, add a field mapping for my destination field name with the name of the source field. And an example of that is add a field mapping for the revision UID column to get the same value as the UID column from my source database. It also allows you to provide default <coughs> values so add field mapping, I have my field name, I don't have anything after it, but I do say give it a default value of 1 in this case. So that field doesn't require a mapping with anything else that exists in the table. It's whenever it needs to fill out that particular field, it'll just put the value 1 there. You can also provide it no value. So you can say add field mapping for that field path that I have and issue the group of DNM, and DNM stands for does not matter. You can also, certain types of fields, you uh, also require arguments or separators for kind of splitting up the content. So like files, the way they are set up right now is you have to, if you have multiple files associated with a particular node, you have to give separators for where this file exists, what, what it's going to be going into, and and then the separator will split it out into an array and run through each value. Yes? Do you have to run DNM through T? Pardon? Do you have to run DNM through T? Like no, no you don't. It's, it's just a, it's a habit at this point. Is that a, a group, is that a delivered group or is this something that, that you guys came up with uh, politically? DNM uh, the author of the module came up with DNM, so it wasn't me. I just translated to whatever other language might use it. And I in Spanish. Yes. So 
we've done all of the mapping, we've done, we've gone through all of those pieces, and then there's the optional area where you can add additional data or clean up anything that you have. So you have this public function prepare row, and it's provided whatever row it's currently on in that source uh, database. And in there, then you can start adding any additional fields. So in this example, I give what I want to do is I want to get the correct user ID based on the username that um, that I'm pulling in as part of the query, and it's there in the prior code that I had. And once I execute it, what I'm doing is setting the current <coughs> row's user ID equal to this row that that I'm getting from the query I'm running at that point uh, with the new value that I want. And finally we get into, you know, once you have all of that set up, it's all looking wonderful. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put it into the second step at this point. So, you know, once I have, once you have all of these mappings set up, in my case, I'm showing things that haven't been set up quite yet as well. But that doesn't mean that you can't migrate any of the content that you have. It'll just happen to be missing certain fields. And what you do at that point is you run one of these drush commands that are there. So drush ms lists the various migration import classes that you have. So you don't necessarily have to be looking at the UI that Drupal provides um, you know, on the website to be able to see what you have at your, uh, at your fingertips. And then you use drush mi with the name of the import class that you have to import any content, and drush mr import class to roll back or remove any content that you brought in. And it also comes with options. So you can provide it certain uh, IDs if you only want to be pulling in certain IDs from the source database. You can also give it an item limit, so only pull 50 items instead of 5 million items if you're just testing things out, because obviously if you have to roll back, 5 million items is going to take a long time. Um, as I mentioned, you can get feedback, so show some status report every, every X seconds or every X items. And there are a few other commands that you can do as well, but these are probably the ones that you'll use the most. And let me just do a sample migration in this scenario. So, make that a little bit. sure. So, I'm going to run drush ms. And now it shows me there's Redcat basic page, event, gallery, and user. And in the user, you can see it's already imported all 22 rows that I had for it. But for the gallery, event, and page, I haven't written, imported any. So let's start with an import of the, of the basic page. So drush mi redcat basic page. I should have put a status here. So then I'd know what's going on. But anyways, it, it does it relatively quickly. Eight and a half seconds. Now, if I go back to my content section, you'll see that all of this content has come in to the site. And you can see that it's been associated with the appropriate users as well, based off that, core, that processing role that I'd shown. However, if I go to a piece of content like the About the Gallery page, or let's see, what's another page? Uh, such as the artist opportunities, it's missing, um, it's missing all of the uh, actual text. And this was on purpose, obviously, I was showing because I hadn't done the mappings. Obviously, those fields couldn't be brought in. So this is where uh, the migrate module becomes really powerful. After you screw up enough times, you all you can do is you can type in mr cat 
right, cat basic page. And let's say if we wanted to provide Give me feedback every five seconds. Hopefully this works. Actually, it didn't need to work. It rolled back everything in 0 0.8 seconds. seconds. So now if I go back to my uh, content area and I look at what content's in there, there's nothing. It's been able to roll it all out cleanly. So now let's see. Check out... Mm. Okay, so now I've I've done the mapping of the two fields that I was missing. You know, all of that's there. So now time to test it out again. Okay, so all of the content came in. Nothing failed. That's a good sign, usually. When is it not a good sign? When is it not a good sign? It'll start spewing out errors at you. No, no, when, it, when, when nothing <laughs> fails, when it's not a good sign. Pardon? You said, you said it didn't fail. That's a good sign usually. Yes. <laughs> when is it not a good sign? When you have something badly written in your code, but uh, it doesn't uh, come off as an error. And that's the worst. So we have associated images that I brought in. And now you can see it has a body and some teaser content in there as well to go with it. So now, now I know the whole mapping was successful in this case. And it brought in all of the files, all of that stuff from the other site as well with it. So I'm near the end of my presentation. And these are some of the resources that, that are quite helpful in all of this stuff. So if you go to the Migrate module project itself, there's very, very limited amount of documentation at the node that I've specified underneath it. So if you're going to look at anything, you're probably better off looking at the examples module that they provide. You'll have to read through a lot of stuff and just try and understand what's going on, but it pays off in the long run. Uh, the Migrate Extras module just provides additional mappings for fields that don't exist in Drupal Core, such as date. That's, that's one that's there in Migrate Extras and, and kind of being worked It's being worked on by me, I mistake. Uh, there's the WordPress migrate module, uh, and this will this utilizes the migrate module to import any WordPress sites that you have into Drupal. Um, if you go to crive.com slash import, it provides the additional Drush documentation that's there for the migrate module, and the two uh, shortened URLs are for my site, or the first one is for my site where I'm starting to document out how you do this migration in in more de in better detail than maybe this presentation might have shown. And the second one is all of the code that I wrote for the Red Cat migration project is now in the sandbox on Drupal.org as well. So you can take a look through it and uh, get a better understanding of how all of it works and probably utilize it on your own site as well. And with that, um, we'll take some questions, but also thank you for sitting through and I don't see anyone sleeping, so thank you for that, too. <laughs> Migration from Drupal 5 to Drupal 7. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Any suggestions? Pray. Well, <laughs> I've done... Can you repeat the question? Heard the mic. So the question was migrating a site from Drupal 5 to Drupal 7. <clears throat> First thing you could try is, is there a feasible way to upgrade your site? If everything exists, if the architecture that you have is sound, then try that method first. If it isn't, then you can try and give something like the migrate module a try. So you just set up your entire site as you would envision it from scratch in Drupal 7, and then figure out how you want to migrate all of that content in. You could probably utilize the feeds module, that's one method, or you can utilize the migrate module. And those would be the two best ways. Did that answer your? Okay. Bill, a question on that, on top of that. Um, what if the path 
what if 80% of the modules have an upgrade path and you've got 90%, you've got two or three modules that are, you know, dead? Uh, would, could, could you turn off those modules, <coughs> migrate everything else, and then migrate those tables that are required? Yeah, like so what you can do is... Yeah, which, which approach might you... I guess it depends. It, it entirely depends on how critical those other modules are. If they haven't been fleshed out yet, then I'd probably participate in the issue queue first and try and get those up to date on Drupal 7 before I start thinking about uh, utilizing Drupal 7 in its full capacity. Michael? Oh, sorry. Support? Pardon? How is Slack file support with this? Excellent. It supports CSV, it supports XML, it can support JSON as well. And when you look at the migrate module, they have an example of importing things from a CSV file as well. A lot of what we have is like still an HTML, big blocks and chunks of stuff. So right. is there anything that this is providing that can help me, you know, go through those kinds of files and start categorizing and putting them into, you know, I'm not entirely sure on that. I, my understanding is that. I think we have an answer on the left. Side. HTML import module. It's fantastic. Okay. Close to okay. There's also we'll a query path. Yeah. Yeah. You probably want to be using path, it with that. Which is can you can you can it's like a uh, like a uh, I think it's it's kind of like JavaScript, but it. To, to be able to scrape HTML and scrape pages. Perfect. It works with feeds that way. And my understanding. What was the name of that module? Uh, query path. There's also XPath, which is the PHP version, written by the same person. And to just for go further on your question, from my understanding, there does seem to be a way to be able to at least list out the series of files that you would have. Um, as part of your mapping or whatever, and then you could probably use something like the process row to be able to do those individual mappings of the different things right. that you have. <clears throat> and you can utilize, right, and then you could utilize something like the query path module in there to be able to, you know, wrangle all those pieces of data that you have. Uh, so I'm, uh, HTML import, uh, uh, migrate, WordPress, anything for Joomla? I mean, or is it just like treat yourself and start over? <laughs> migrate module. <laughs> something custom from the migrate module would be your best bet for now. There isn't something that people have contributed quite yet. That said, if you're the first one to do it, I'd be very happy to see it up on Drupal.org as well. Sure. Questions can continue. So we are at the end of our meetup tonight. We have time for one more question. One more. Anyone?